Well, let me get to a couple things um, to wrap up the call. Um, mm -hmm. So I've been uh, <clears throat> working with my man, Ed Soto, who's working on um, uh, some lead programs that he's been able to really kind of refine. And so now finally the Alliance is going to um, go ahead and um, offer it, but it's not, well, I, won't, I won't say, you know, Ed's the one that kind of produced it and the Alliance is um, uh, using Ed's system through another vendor. And, um, you know, Ed's, uh, he's got a, a really large agency. Brandon Beal is in Ed's agency. And so Ed's been uh, instrumental in putting together um, a final expense lead program that appears to be working very well. There's uh, elements about it that um, the way that it's created creates some you know, really, really good, good intent leads. I mean, good intent. Okay. <clears throat> and then there's another version of the lead that's higher intent. Okay. So they make, they make the, the client, they put them through a lot of questions and a lot of pages of information. So they really kind of put the client through a gauntlet before they produce that lead. And these leads are going to come in like, don't quote me, but, you know, we think they're going to be in that uh, 10 to $15 range. And then the higher intent leads are probably going to be in the $25 range. Okay. So this is the higher intent leads are the one that they really make them go through the gauntlet. Okay. And uh, preliminary findings are that um, Ed's agents are closing, not only the really good ones. Okay. But the ones that are just more average agents are starting to get these now, but uh, the Alliance has signed a deal to uh, put these in play over the next few weeks. So we're very encouraged about them. The other part of this, I'm probably more excited about this part is that if we can figure out how to get the automation distributed to agents, there's another automation piece where and this one is actually the one that's been kicking butt is where the client um, books appointments on the agent's calendar. And one of our agents is just killing it um, with this version of the lead where it's all preset appointments. And he's, a, he's really good. Like he's really got top sales skills and kind of the beauty of it is he's very lazy. He just does not want, he does telesales. And he does not want to call to book appointments. He just refuses. He goes, I don't want to do it anymore. And I want to spend time with my family. I want to write business over the phone. That's all I want to do. And he's killing it, man. They're booking on his calendar. And then he's meeting with them over the phone, closing them, you know, next. And um, so that the automated piece is another important chunk that, that needs to be figured out. So I don't know if, how soon that part will come out, but um, anyway, these are very affordable. And, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, when these are released to you all, I, and I will be on the inside. So I'll know, I'll know everything that's going on. Okay. With it. So I'm excited about that. Um, Ed's also working with me on a, a on estate planning lead generation. We tried that and failed because the people we're working with really didn't know what they were doing. Ed's guy knows what he's doing. Um, so can you imagine getting estate planning leads, right? And you know, if you got a if you're a licensee, you make a thousand dollars per estate plan, plus you get to write all the business on the trust funding. So annuities and IULs. Um, so we'll see what these leads cost and what. I've already I already paid them for the initial <clears throat> the initial um, production, so we're we're going to go through an experiment of it, and, and I'm the one that's going to receive them, so I'll be able to know um, know them pretty well. Although I've done like two estate plans, um, I've got two estate plans I've done recently, and I've got one coming up Friday. I'm finishing up one Friday as well. And I got another one um, through Mary's friend um, that we're doing, Fran, 
who's 80 something and uh, needs to get our estate planning kind of redone. And there's some asset opportunities there. She's got um, her husband still has money in stocks. If you can believe it. She's how old? Mary, 80 what? Seven? Anyway, she's older and I don't I think know. She's 80, I think she's 84. I don't think she's turned 85 yet. But okay, 84. Yeah. She doesn't need to have her assets in stocks. And obviously her broker doesn't want to tell her that. So uh, there are other things we might be able to do for her. But that's what amazed, that's amazed me about estate planning is the ability to get insight to all their assets. So, you know, there's some really good stuff going on there. So we're going to be working on that lead program. Um, but, I, you know, things are looking up, man. Um, we're going to get, uh, you know, really focused on providing, you know, better leads and getting you guys into a uh, you know, really good opportunity to, you know, turn that lead investment around. All right. So that to me is um, the announcements that I wanted to really share with you. Again, um, as I blasted out, I'm going to be in Orlando tomorrow night. And then I'll be doing a hotspot meeting in Tallahassee the following night. And so if you know anybody in those areas, I already have agents that have recruits booked into both those meetings. So I'm really excited about, about that. Anyway, um, I want to share with you, I think this is really something that we need to think about sometimes as agents, um, because it's so easy to get kind of caught up in the weeds of running leads, booking appointments, you know, running sales. Um, and then there's those of us that are just getting started and, you know, just learning the, the process. And and there are veterans out there that just, you know, you get caught up in all the noise, right? And sometimes you don't think about, I don't think about what we're really doing here. And um, you'll see kind of, I'm going to, I just picked this up. These these two posts really, I don't know, just really captured my heart. And so I want to cover this with you just because um, I think it'd be something to think about as we're going out there trying to serve families. So this this story, I can't tell you if this is true or not, but even if it, even if it isn't, it's the... Um, the allegory of it, I think, is what really is intriguing here. Um, a pastor transformed himself into a homeless person and went to the church that he was about to be introduced as the head pastor at that morning. So he walked around his soon-to-be church for 30 minutes while it was filling with people for service. Only three people said hello to him. Most looked the other way. He asked people for change to buy food because he's hungry. Not one gave him anything. He went into the sanctuary to sit down in, in the front of the church and was told by the ushers that he would need to get up and go sit in the back of the church. He said hello to people as they walked in, but was greeted with cold stares and dirty looks from people looking down at him, on him and judging him. He sat in the back of the church and listened to the church announcements for the week. He listened as new visitors were welcomed into the church that morning, but no one acknowledged that he was new. He watched people around him continue to look his way with stares that said, you are not welcome here. Then the elders of the church went to the podium to make the announcement. They said they were excited to introduce the new pastor of the church to the congregation. We'd like to introduce you to our new pastor. The congregation stood up and looked around, clapping with joy and anticipation. The homeless man sitting in the back stood up and started walking down the aisle. That's when all the clapping stopped and the church was silent with all eyes on him. He walked up, to, walked up the altar and reached for the microphone. He stood there for a moment and then recited so elegantly, a verse from the Bible. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. 
For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give, give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for the least of my brothers and sisters, you did for me. After he recited this, he introduced himself as their new pastor, and he told the congregation what he had experienced that morning. Many began to cry and bow their heads in shame. Today I see a gathering of people here, but I do not see a church of Jesus. The world has enough people that look the other way. What the world needs is disciples of Jesus that can follow his teachings and live as he did. When will you decide to become disciples? He then dismissed the service until the following Sunday, as his sermon had been given. Wow. So I remember this Bible verse because I had a chance to spend a golf outing with John Maxwell. Uh, it was a small group of us in the Alliance and John, and we had a, um, I flew to Atlanta to play golf with John Maxwell. And so, uh, so we sat at, you know, after the 18th hole and, and John's a pretty good golfer and, you know, the, the, the leadership guru and he, we asked him, we were just asking him questions. And he said, you know, because he used to be a pastor and didn't really like being a pastor. But, you know, we we're asking him, I forgot the context of the question. Um, I think the question was something like, so, John, what, you know, as you look at your, you know, your service and things you've been doing in leadership, you know, tell us what, you know, what, what does it really mean to you, right? And so he proceeded to tell this Bible verse and um, the sheep and the goats, separating the sheep and the goats. And um, it was very profound that he said that. And when I read that, it was like, yeah, man, sometimes we forget, right? We forget that the people we treat um, like crap, the people that we don't, you know, that we yell at and we think they're, you know, slime balls or they're, we get angry at because they're not doing what we're supposed to do, you know, and we, you know, and we're all judgy, 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 judgy. You know, we're always looking down on people. And I'm just saying general. I mean, I'm not saying you, but you know how sometimes we get when we, you know, are mad at something and, you know, and not remembering, you know, why we're doing it. It's, not, it's like we get, we're nice to the people that we think we can get something from, right? We're nice to the people, like we kiss our butts because we think we can get something from them, right? Instead of being nice to them and caring about them because, you know, behind them is Christ looking at you. You know, they're Christ embodied in that other person, you know, and that everything you're doing for them, you're doing for Christ. And that's what Mother Teresa has always felt when she's was serving the sick, the lonely, the um, people were dying alone in India. I mean, if you read her story, she created a whole ministry out of being with the people that were dying, that were poor, and many of them dying alone out of starvation. And she just did not want someone to die alone. You know, so anyway. So anyway, it was like, why, after I read that post, I read this other one. This is a real, this is a real person. You know, Bishop David, um, I think it's McConnell, he was a, a bishop in Los Angeles, just recently killed, tragically killed. And um, this person wrote this about him. So this is a real bishop, Catholic bishop. You know, Fernando, for I'm sure Fernando probably heard about this uh, shooting out there. Um, so this is what they wrote about Bishop David. Before becoming a bishop, he was a pastor in a very violent gang neighborhoods, and this was where his heart was. As pastor at St. Michael's, he walked his parish boundary 
and consecrated the entire area to St. Michael the Archangel, violence precipitously dropped. He would find men and women on the street, talk with them and give them jobs. Paint our gym. I need a fence put up. He gave them purpose, paid them for the work, and those people started coming to Mass. For this and so many other reasons, a once dead parish came back to life. He worked with the police and community leaders to broker peace during periods of particularly high gang violence in LA's past. He had a full theology of the body course at his parish teaching, quote unquote, soon to be ex prostitutes, addicts, and others their dignity in the eyes of God. He lived in poverty despite taking a bishop's salary. He spent his salary to pay the rent of others quietly. Then in parentheses, I only know this because I know multiple people slash families who told me at one point or another that Bishop Dave was helping them out. He would drop everything to pray with someone, speak words of healing, consolation, and love. I saw this over and over. He was a spiritual director to more people than I can count at all levels of society. He would go out and knock on doors just to get to know people, talk about Jesus and see what he could do to help. He hated that priests got moved around so much. He said, a priest marries his people, and I just want to be back with my flock. He genuinely loved them deeply. He once told a friend that the greatest pain of his life was becoming a bishop. When he got the call, he became depressed. But he obediently followed, not knowing where it would lead. And for walking that path, he touched so many more people. He became a spiritual father to countless people around the archdiocese, to so many priests, to so many more families and apostolates. The world is better for it, but for him, it was about each and every relationship. Lastly, he was a comedian. To blow off steam, Bishop Day could sometimes be found wearing his favorite flannel shirt on stage, microphone in hand, making people who had no idea who he was laugh. May he rest in peace. Amen. So when I read that, it was like, golly, <laughs> how short I am falling in my desire to be like him and you know, to be Christ like, actually, you know, to, uh, you know, spread kindness and uplift others who need uplifting and, you know, live more about life of service versus a life of greed and, um, you know, acquisition of things. So anyway, just, I felt like I want to read that to y'all just to remind you that, you know, we are more than just life insurance agents. We're going out there and we're serving people. Just like Mark said, Mark had has that spirit of service and, you know, we're not taking people's money. You know, we are serving them with products that will help their family you know, when they pass away. And when you look at all the things that we do, there, you know, there's always two ways to look at it, two sides of the coin. One side of the coin is, you know, it's all about the money. The other side of the coin, it's all about the people, right? And so one thing I've always said for a long time, it's love people and use things. Don't love things and use people. We love people, right? And the things that we use are things to help us get to them, so we can go serve them with the best of our abilities and the best of our hearts. It's probably more like it, the best of our hearts. And so when we care more, I think the blessings will happen more, right? When you take the eyes off yourself and your pitiful problems and you put your eyes on other people and how you can help them and serve them more than looking at your pitiful problem, it's amazing how your problems go away and all you're concerned about is how can I help another person? You take the eyes off yourself and put them on other people. I promise you, your life's going to get better no matter how depressed you are, how woe is me you are. And I I do it too, falling in the self-pity, you know, self-pity party. When I start focusing on you, agents, when I start focusing on how I can make life better for you, because I know that if I can make your life better and your 
you know, getting out to people easier and teaching you techniques on how to serve people better, that you're going to be much more value to the people that you serve. And that's my job, right? To help you find the value in, in yourself that you can give to other people, right? And so there's a lot of responsibility on me to make sure I have my act together to give you something of value. So I'm always working on that, working my salvation out with fear and trembling. So anyway, thanks everybody for being on this call. I want you to think about that. Like when you go to bed tonight, just you know, say a prayer that you will wake up tomorrow, a new person going out to serve and looking at people and what you can do for them, not what they can do for you. Okay. So amen. God bless everybody. Take care and uh, have a great week. Rock on. Bye, everybody.